Let's open our Bibles to uh, Amos chapter 7. Today we're going to cover 17 verses. The characters today in today's chapter are Amos, of course. You know, God's been using him. He's, he's a writer of this book. Uh, God is the, the other character. There's times when uh, Amos is speaking, and, and then you'll know if your Bible has quotes, uh, when, when the Lord is speaking. Uh, we have another character that we're going to introduce today as well. His name is uh, Amaziah. He was one of, the, one of the priests there, one of the false uh, pagan priests uh, in the northern kingdom. Don't confuse him. I think there's four Amaziahs in the Bible. The two known ones uh, are Amaziah. He was one of the kings of the southern kingdom in Judah. This is not him. And this is one, I think this is a fourth Amaziah. It's not, we don't hear too much about him other than here in Amos chapter 7. He was just one of the false priests there. Uh, sort of a, they worshipped uh, golden calves and, and, and um, you know, Baal, all kinds of stuff. Uh, the other character we're, we're sort of going to hear about is uh, Jeroboam, Jeroboam the second. He was the son of Jeroboam the first. A little quick uh, history, uh, when, the, when the kingdom split up, uh, there was Jeroboam. He, he became the first king of, of, of Israel in the northern kingdom. And, there, and then there was Rehoboam, okay, with an R. It's just a difference in the R and the J. He was in charge of the southern kingdom. That's when the kingdom uh, split up. So this is the son, Jeroboam the second, that, that we're going to talk about today. The purpose of this chapter was to warn the people. And, and it's sort of the same thing over and over again. You know, God is warning the people. Another theme that we can see in, 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 in actually the whole book is repentance. You know, a call to repent, a call to turn, to turn from God. And we're going to talk about that word a little, quite a, quite a few times here. That word repent and what, is it, what does it really mean? And, and in what context can we use it? Does it have another context as far as when it's used in, in the scripture? And uh, practicality. We're going to talk about prayer as well, intercession. We're going to talk about visions. You know, what does the Bible have to say about uh, visions? And we're going to see into the heart of God today as well. I know the book of Hosea, you know, we, we sort of saw the heart of God. We saw God's uh, relentlessness towards sort of a, a pursuing love towards uh, his bride the, the, in the Old Testament, which is Israel. Well, today we're going to look into the, the heart of God as well. Let's open our Bibles to uh, Amos chapter 7. I'll go ahead and read the verses, and then we'll open it in prayer. Amos 7, verse 1. Thus saith the Lord, God showed me, Behold, he formed locust swarms at the beginning of the lay crop. Indeed, it was a lay crop after the king's mowings. And so it was, when they had finished eating the grass of the land, that I said, O Lord God, forgive, I pray, Oh, that Jacob may stand, for he is small. So the Lord relented concerning this. It shall not be, saith the Lord. Thus the Lord God showed me. Behold, the Lord God called, from, called for conflict by fire, and it consumed the great deep and devoured the territory. Then I said, O oh Lord God, cease, I pray. Oh, that Jacob may stand, for he is small. So the Lord relented concerning this. This also shall not be, said the Lord God. And verse 7, Thus he showed me, Behold, the Lord stood on a wall made with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, A plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not pass by them any more. The high places of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. I will rise with the sword against the house of Jeroboam. Verse 10, then Amaziah the priest of Bethel said, uh, sent to Jeroboam king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive from their own land. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Go, you seer, flee to the land of Judah. There eat bread, and there prophesy. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary. And it is a royal residence. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor was I a son of a prophet, but I was a sheep breeder and a tender of sycamore fruit. Verse 15. Then the Lord took me as I, as I follow the flock. And the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people in Israel. Now therefore hear the word of the Lord. You say, Do not prophesy against Israel, and do not spout against the house of Isaac. Therefore thus says the Lord, 
Your wife shall be a harlot in the city. Your sons and daughters shall fall by the sword. Your land shall be divided by, by survey line. You shall die in a defiled land, and Israel shall surely be led away captive from his own land. Dear Father, we thank you, Father God, because you're graceful, you're merciful, and, and your hand of, of grace is upon us, Father God. We pray, Lord, for tonight, Father God. We pray that you lift our spirits up. We pray that we can focus on your word, Father God. We pray that we can apply worth to each and every jot and tittle found in, your, in the Holy Scriptures, Father God, because it's all inspired by you, Lord. We pray, Father God, that you just speak to us tonight, Father God, that you uh, just pour into us through your word, through your Holy Spirit, Father God. We pray, Father God, that you just enable us to, to follow you better, Father God, but most of all, just to feel your love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This uh, chapter, I divided it into four. Uh, if, if, you're, if you read more than one Bible, if you're not a King James only type of guy, um, you'll notice that the different, uh, write, uh, the different translators of the Bible, they'll divide different sections. You know, the, this one's pretty easy. Uh, it's divided by visions and, and sort of a conversation that Amos has with uh, Amaziah. So um, to, there's actually five visions, and we're not going to cover all five of them today. We're going to cover three. The first vision is found in, uh, in verses uh, 1 through 3. The next, it, they're divided into three verses. And then the next vision is in verses uh, 4 to uh, 6, I believe. And then the next uh, verses after that. The f now God is going to give uh, Amos uh, some visions. Some people can agree as far as if he was dreaming or if it was an actual vision uh, when he was awake. But, but we see that Amos is talking to God at the same time. And uh, a little bit about visions... Um, I know in Joel, I'm not sure if it's chapter 2 or chapter 3, but it talks about in the last days that uh, your sons and, and daughters shall, shall prophesy, you know, they, they shall dream dreams and, and, and see visions and, and whatnot, you know. Today we, we live in an age of, of grace of the Holy Spirit, and, and we still practice some gifts of the, of, that the Holy Spirit gives, gives to us, you know, like prophecy and, and uh, sort of a, some, I guess what I'm trying to say is, don't believe everything out there, you know, if, if you guys are, are Bereans, you know, if you, if you see, uh, compare everything to the Word of God, right? See if these things are so, like Paul says in Acts 17, 11, I believe, you know, like the Bereans. In uh, the New Testament, we see visions. We see Peter see a vision. He sees a vision of, of, a, of a sort of a white sheet and, and, and different uh, animals that were considered unclean. And God was trying to show him something because uh, God has spoken, he, God has shown Cornelius another vision, and Cornelius was, was a Gentile, and, and God wanted Peter to go out to the Gentiles and to preach to them the, the gospel so they can, you know, accept uh, Jesus and the Holy Spirit come upon them. And God was going to use Peter to do that. But God, God first showed him a vision, a sort of a, a sheet in the sky with, with animals. And God told him, you know, do not call unclean what I, had, what I have uh, cleaned. So um, we see new visions in the New Testament as well. And today, extra-biblical visions, we see a lot of cults. They get started through, through false visions of... Let's think about uh, the Mormons, right? The Mormons get started with a sort of a vision that uh, Joseph Smith had. He said an angel came to him, an angel named uh, Moroni, and, and he, he sort of uh, showed him the tablets, and then he showed him how to read them and all that. You know, the Bible says, you know, even if, an, even if we are an angel come to you with another gospel other than the one we presented to you, you know, do not believe him because the devil comes in, uh, clothed as an angel. The, um, the, dev, the, the wolf comes in sheep's clothing. You guys get what I mean. So there are false visions and there are true visions. This, this was a very true vision that, that God was, God was uh, showing Amos. And the first vision is about uh, locusts. You guys remember, if you guys were here through, through my message on uh, Joel, we, we saw the, um, how God literally, it wasn't a vision, God actually brought locusts, a plague of locusts to, uh, to the southern kingdom. Now, now we're focusing on the northern kingdom. And God was going to bring a plague of locusts on them. But, but see what happens. Let's read verses 1 through 3 again. Thus the Lord God showed me. Behold, he formed locust swarms at the beginning of the late crops. Indeed, it was a late crop after the king's mowing. And so it was when they had finished eating the grass of the land that I said, O Lord God, forgive. I pray, O that Jacob may stand, for he is small. So the Lord relented concerning this. It shall not be, said the Lord. So we see several things here. And, and uh, in, verse, in verse 1, we see the actual vision where, where God is showing uh, Amos something. It says, thus the Lord God showed me. So, so you're going to see those, those five words repeated three times at the beginning of each verse. It says what? Behold, he formed locust swarms. That was the, the first uh, judgment he was going to bring upon Israel. 
at the beginning of the late crop. Indeed, it was the late crop after the king's mowings. What would happen is well, the people heavily relied on, you know, they were gregarian people. They relied on, on the culture, they, on, the, on the crops, on the fields and all that. Now, back then the king got first dibs. You know, he, he was a guy that, 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 that got the 10%. Actually, he was actually getting 30%. If you, if you research, the king was actually getting 30% of, of the first uh, produce of the crops. So everything that grew, the first stuff that came out, the, the king got that. It was for the king and to feed the king's animals and his family. But God was going to bring a judgment after the king got his, uh, you know, at, at the beginning of the late crop, during the second, uh, second wave of, of, of produce there. It says, indeed, it was a late crop after the king's mowings. And so it was when they had finished eating the grass of the land. So, so, so Mo, uh, Amos is seeing this, right? He's seeing the vision that the locusts that God was preparing, that the locusts were already uh, eating the, 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 the produce there, and that's what was going to happen. And it says in, uh, in verse 2, And so it was when they had finished eating the grass of the land that I said, this is Amos' first prayer, O Lord God, forgive, I pray, O that Jacob may stand, for he is small. Now, Jacob is referring to, to the northern kingdom, and you'll see it exchanged every now and then, Jacob and then Isaac. Um, so we see, we've sort of seen Amos uh, pronouncing judgment all along. Now we're going to see into Amos's heart, th th this farmer, this guy from the southern kingdom, he actually cared about these people that he was, he was pronouncing judgment against. It says, O Lord God, forgive, I pray, O that Jacob may stand, for he is small. I think uh, we don't know exactly how long Amos had been there. He had been in the northern kingdom now for a bit, but we don't know exactly how long he was preaching in Bethel. And um, we do know this. We sort of get a, a, a sneak, peek, sneak peek into his heart, and, and he has a heart for the people. I think every prophet, every evangelism, every evangelist or, or preacher, whatever, every focus should be, uh, you know, on God and, and, and on loving people. You know, if, if you can't love people, you shouldn't uh, be ministering to people. So this guy, this guy had a heart for the people. And God was trying to show him something here as well. It wasn't so much about pronouncing judgment against uh, Israel. Look at verse 3. So the Lord relented concerning this. What does God say? It shall not be, said the Lord. So the Lord stopped this locust from coming. So what was the whole purpose of God sort of showing this vision to, to Amos? Did Amos change God's mind? Do our prayers for that fact change God? Can we change God's mind? And that's a hard one to answer because uh, we, we sort of get into the whole, uh, you know, free will versus, uh, you know, our, our, the free uh, moral agent versus uh, God's sovereignty, you know. And uh, as the Calvary Chapel, we usually stick, uh, you know, we give, keep a balanced view uh, uh, of it all. And you got to watch out when you have a fatalistic view about anything. You know, if you say, if you lean too far to the right and say, well, you know, Jesus only died for those that, that, that uh, he didn't die for the whole world. He only died for uh, for those that would eventually accept them, you know, that's, that's taking a, a heavy, heavy fatalistic view. And uh, that, that's a hyper Calvinistic view. So you got to watch out with those views. But it is healthy to talk about this. And, and God did relent. That word right there. So the Lord relented concerning this. This sort of uh, ha ha brings us to the doctrine of uh, immutability. I know I haven't talked about that in, in a bit. But uh, I was teaching through a, through a series on doctrine probably a year ago. Now, and uh, I taught through the doctrine of the Trinity, the doctrine of, of uh, I'm not sure if I got into salvation, doctrine of the church and whatnot. But immutability is a, a, a sort of a rare one. But all it means is that God does not change. God is unchanging. And we're going to go over some verses to see what this actually means, that God does not change and what aspect of God does not change. Do our prayers uh, change God's mind? Let's see in Malachi chapter 3, uh, verse 6. It says, for I am the Lord, I do not change. Okay, it's pretty easily understood. James uh, 1, 17, in the New English translation, it says, All generous giving and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or the slightest hint of change. Okay, there it is again. Numbers 23, 19, in the English Standard Version, it says, God is not man that he should lie, or a son of man, that is a human being, that he should change his mind. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? So, so God does not necessarily change. But we do see in the Bible that God relents. Okay? That, that's, that, that's, it, it's an interpreting that word. What does it mean? Uh, I think the King James says uh, God repented. 
if I'm correct. It might be another translation that says that. But what does it mean that God repented? It means that God changed uh, a direction, but it doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that he changed his mind. Okay? Uh, it, uh, another translation says uh, he felt sorry. Okay? So it has to do with that. You've got to sort of remember this. Uh, context is key to biblical interpretation. Read the rest of the passage. What does it say? Uh, and you'll find uh, your answer. So there's that word again, relent. Um, com let's compare that to, to Noah's day. In, uh, in uh, Genesis chapter 6, verse 6, it says, And the Lord was sorry, though that's the same word again, was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. They use that same Hebrew word, but instead of saying God repented, he, it says that God was, was sorry that he had made God. That he had made man. And we know God sort of flooded the whole earth, right? He was going to kill uh, all man. But he spared eight, right? He's no, no one and his family. So there, there was God's love as, as well. God's love doesn't change like the, like the song Joseph was singing right now. And now let's talk about Nineveh. Uh, still talking about God's uh, 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 relentlessness. Jonah chapter 3 verse 10. Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. Okay, so this is where it gets a little bit more interesting because if we remember correctly, God sends uh, you know, Jonah the prophet to Nineveh and uh, he told them to repent. And what, what happened? They repented. It wasn't expected from, from uh, Jonah's point of view. From our point of view, from our finite minds, we, we, we don't understand God and we, we, I don't think we can understand God and we're not really ever going to, I don't think, for that matter. But God is just so infinite. His love, his, his grace, and everything about God, the creator of the universe, all we can do is go by what the Bible says. If we, if we go out of it, we're, we're sort of just focusing on our own opinions. But it says, Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. So what we know is that God pronounces judgment. He says, okay, I'm going to judge you here if you don't repent. So he put, sort of puts a, a clause there. Uh, if, if you do this, I'm not going to punish you. And it's not so much about God changes his mind. It's because God is omniscient. He knows all things. And he is faithful as well. Three things we can get from this. Amos prayed, right? What does that talk about? Free will. We have free will. We can pray. We have the power of prayer. Second thing, God answered his prayer. It says uh, that, that God relented, right? So God relented his judgment God was still going to judge him because he is a just and holy God. He has to judge sin. It's his nature because he's so holy. But the third thing, God knew that Amos would pray. God knew what was going to happen. God is omniscient. Okay? So by what we understand from the Bible, all we can do is this. We can't say, well, why pray if God already knows what I'm going to pray about? If God is going to do his will anyway. No, because God wants you to pray. Because if you prayed and God answered that prayer, well, it, it was not necessarily that it was depending on your prayers for God to do this, but it works hand in hand, okay? So, back to God again. God is sovereign, God is all-knowing, God is just, but we, we must pray. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. God has stuff for us, but we've got to pray. And that's the power of prayer. Amos had the heart for the people, and he prayed. He did something about it, and God answered his prayer. The second part is the second vision here in, in verses 4 to 6. It's a vision of fire. So, so God relented. God sort of decided not, not change his mind. God decided not to, to bring the locust plague. Now let's see what God does about a, a vision of fire. In verse 4, Thus the Lord God showed me. Behold, the Lord God called for conflict by fire, and it consumed the great deep and devoured the territory. Okay, so, so there was a fire that was going to come, maybe, a storm, maybe from a drought, maybe from a war. I don't know. It just says that a fire was coming, for, uh, called for conflict by fire, and it consumed the great deep and devoured the territory. Now, that, that's a great fire if it's referring to water as far as the great deep there. Maybe some wells were destroyed. I'm, I'm not sure what it means. We do know it was a terrible fire that will come upon the, the city there in, in Israel, the, several cities there. But look at Amos. This is Amos' second prayer in verse 5. And it's not that very different from the first one. And it says, Then I said, Amos speaking, O Lord God, cease. That means stop, I pray. O that Jacob may stand, for he is small. There, he's using that word again, Jacob, for, for Israel. 
for he is small. See, he was concerned about the people. Maybe he didn't like Amaziah. Maybe he didn't like Jeroboam or the rich people or the women, the rich women that he called fat cows in a couple of chapters back. But see, he was among the people, okay? He, 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 he knew he had a heart for the people, and he was specifically praying for them as well, I think, because remember in the first judgment, the king was going to get fed, but he was concerned about the, the poor people of the land because they weren't going to get anything. They were the ones that were really going to suffer. So here we see his heart again. I think when we come to prayer, when we come to God, we really got to put our heart into it because we can come to prayer and really just be lax about it, not, not really uh, uh, pray with our heart. We got to, just like we worship God with our heart, just like we teach with our heart upon the scriptures, we should pray with our heart out as well, like Amos here. And we see that there's a result because God answers his prayer. What does it say in verse 6? So the Lord relented concerning this. God says again, this also shall not be, saith the Lord. So God relents from two things. God doesn't change his mind, but God acts upon this man's prayer. God can act upon your prayers if you pray. You just got to trust God. Don't worry so much about God, what God knows and what God does not know. Third vision, the plumb line. That's in verses 7 through 9. Let's read it. Thus he showed me. Behold, the Lord stood on a wall made with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. Let's stop there for a minute. Okay, so now we saw locusts, we saw the fire, now we saw a plumb. What is a plumb line? I'm not, I don't know if we, we use it, I, I don't know if Andrew uses it nowadays, but I know it has to do with construction and making straight walls. Do you use it? Do you use a plumb line? Still? Okay. Well, I know it has a string and there's something hanging from it. I'm not a builder, as you can see. Um, but God, Amos sees a vision. He sees God, you know, and uh, sort of how, uh, remember when uh, uh, the three men were in the, in the fire furnace, right? And then they see, uh, they see somebody else, they see a fourth person, and they see it was, it was the Lord. Well, now see, God, I don't know how God looked like here. I don't know how Amos knows it was God, but he says he saw, he saw God holding a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people. What does that mean? Okay. Now, it's interesting where it says uh, in, in verse 7, behold, the Lord stood on a wall. A wall what? Made with a plumb line. The wall had already been made with a plumb. It, the plumb line was used to make a wall. So the wall was intended to be straight, right? It was a building made with a plumb line. What that means is that he was, God was going to judge Israel, right? But he was checking if Israel was still uh, straight, okay? Because Israelites were supposed to be built upon the law of God, Right, the statutes of the ordinances, not just the Levitical law, uh, you know, uh, get, paying uh, tithes here and there, but the moral law, right? The Ten Commandments, God's ultimate moral law that even today upon the Gentiles, we see in, uh, what is it, uh, Romans chapter 2, that it says everybody that doesn't follow the law, they still have the law in their hearts. You know, the, the conscience convicts us of the certain things as well. So God was going to judge Israel, rightly so, because with this plumb line, with, this, with, with God's standards, Behold, the Lord stood on a wall made with a plumb line. This wall, Israel, had started off right. Israel had started off right with God's moral law, but now God was going to judge it. Let's see where you stand now up against my moral law. It said God had a plumb line in his hand. Verse 8, And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. So Israel's faithfulness was going to get checked out. Are they going to come short or not? I think the answer is pretty simple. Yes, they had been coming short of God's standards. So we see, uh, we see four things now in, uh, in verses 9 and the latter part of verse 8. It says, uh, I will not pass by them anymore. God was no longer going to pass by them anymore. What does that mean? He wasn't going to overlook their sins anymore. Okay? It sort of, uh, if if we go to the the story that Jesus gives one of the uh, one of the men in the old, in the New Testament, where he talks about the Good Samaritan, it says that Levite passed and he passed by the man that, that was hurt, right? The uh, the man that had been hurt, 
And then, uh, you know, the priest passes by, and then he ignores him, right? He ignores that. Well, that's in a negative sense of ignoring something. But God, in a positive sense, he sort of gives us grace, and he ignores some of our sins for a time. Uh, he gives, God gives us, he's patient with us so we can repent. He gives us a certain time for that. And God had been patient with Israel. Obviously, he didn't wipe them off the map right away. He was sending prophets. Again, God will no, long, no longer look past their sins. It says, I will not pass by them anymore. So there is a period of time that God gives us grace, and we as well must take advantage of that and, and repent before he sort of uh, judges us, disciplines us as his children are. If you don't believe me, read Hebrews chapter 12. Then here's a second part that we see in verse 9. The high places of Isaac shall be desolate. When the Bible talks about high places, it's talking about holy places or religious places of worship. So God is saying here, the places of pagan worship, they're going to be destroyed as well. So first thing, I'm no longer going to uh, not judge you for your sins. I'm going to start judging you for them. And the second thing is, I'm going to destroy your, your, uh, your temples, your ritualistic uh, temples there. And now we see a third thing. And the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. Is that the same thing as we saw earlier? I think the sanctuaries here is talking about places that were probably still held to worship God, but they weren't so involved in, in Baal worship. So those, those places as well are, were going to be uh, destroyed. If you guys remember a couple of chapters back, if it was, I don't know if it was 6 or chapter 5, but it says that God was no longer going to take their worship. And he, it's sort of a, this, he, it was despicable to him. So God was going to destroy the, these holy places as well. And the fourth thing we see here is, I will rise with the sword against the house of Jeroboam. He's talking about the king here. God was going to destroy the dynasty uh, of the king. He was going to uh, start judging the people. He was going to destroy the pagan temples and, and any temples of, of true worship as well. And now he was going to destroy the dynasty of uh, Jeroboam. But how, what application can we get from this? How do we measure up to God's plumb line? How do we measure up to God's standards, right? You guys have seen the good test, right? That's a, sort of a, a, an evangelism method. It was, it was kind of popular uh, a, a while back, and I think uh, they still do it. Um, but the, the, I guess you ask people, you know, are you a good person? And then you sort of, have you ever told a lie? You know, have you ever looked at a woman with lust? All these things. Have you ever stolen anything, right? Eventually, you get them to say yes to one of them, and then you show them that verse. The Bible says if you committed one of these, if you've broken one of these commandments, you, it's like if you broke, broke them all, and then you sort of hook them, and you tell them, look, you're, when you stand before God one day, you're going to stand up to his measures, up to his standards, up against his plumb line, and you're going to come short. What are you going to do about it? And you sort of get, put the ball court in the people's hands, and they have to make a choice. And that's the purpose of sort of a law evangelism, to bring him to, to, to acknowledge that, that they're sinners, right? So this is what God was doing. He was judging the people against his righteous, holy standards. So how do we measure up? Do we come short? Yeah, we come short. We're, the Bible says all are sinners. None is good. We, we come short of the glory of God. But that's talking about a positional shortness, right? We, we, uh, we need to acknowledge that before we, we, we come to God in, in repentance and we accept Him as our Lord, right? So there's two kinds of righteousness here, okay? Stay with me. There's a positional righteousness. That is, do you have a right standing with God? And I, I suppose everybody here has a right standing with God. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're born again, right? You have, a, you're, you have a positional righteousness. It doesn't change because you have Jesus' blood upon you. God the Father doesn't see that, your sins anymore. But there is a practical righteousness, okay? Your walk with the Lord. How is it? How is your walk with the Lord coming up against that? That uh, God's, uh, you know, God's law of faith, if I may say that. Are we coming short? Are we practicing sin? Are we being, I like what Raul Reese says, you know, uh, that there's, there's carnal Christians and there's Christians that are being led by the Holy Spirit. I do believe, I think a Christian can be carnal. You know, if you don't believe me, ask your wife. Ask my wife. She will tell you, I am, I can get carnal. Here's a story by a minister who told his congregation one day. He said, next week I plan to preach about the sin of lying. To help you understand my sermon, I want you all to read Mark 17. The following Sunday, as he prepared to deliver his sermon, the minister asked for a, few, for a show of hands. He wanted to know how many had read Mark 17. Everybody's hand went up. The minister smiled and said, Mark has only 16 chapters. I will now proceed with my sermon on the sin of lying, right? Sin is applicable to us. We all sin, right? The thing is, we shouldn't practice it. We shouldn't practice it. You see, it all goes back to what Jesus did on the cross for our sins. Every sermon, every, every text, it should all go back to what Jesus did on the cross for us. It all points back to him. And in Hebrew, it tells us it's about Jesus. Jesus was in the text in the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's all about Jesus. So God is a righteous judge. 
Okay, he's going to judge. It's in his nature. But now no longer that judgment is going to go upon us. It, it went upon Jesus on the cross. So God didn't change. God's judgment just took a direction over here to his righteous and holy son, the, the acceptable sacrifice. And that's what salvation is about. He was perfect. Nonetheless, we are called to, to live holy lives, though. As far as our practical righteousness, we are call, we're called to live holy lives. Let's see in Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verse 14 to 15. What does it say? It says, Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord, looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Okay? So God is calling us to what? To live a what kind of life? Holy life. Let's try that again. I'm going to give you guys another. What kind of life? Holy, Holy life. Yes. Okay. Hebrews chapter 12, 14 in the New Living Translation, just to clear it up for you if you guys didn't understand it. Work at living in peace with everyone and work at living a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. You see, it, it, it's, it, it should come natural. If you're born again, if you're really born again, eventually, maybe not right away, but as you grow in the Word of God, you are going to start living a holy life, a set-apart life. Not a perfect life. Nobody's perfect, only Jesus. But He calls us to live a holy life, to be, live a separate part of life, a separate uh, type of life. Zig, uh, Ziegler uh, uh, said, you see, if you aim at nothing, you will hit every time. If we, if we, if we live a life of, of just uh, of failure, I'm, I'm born, I said a prayer 20 years ago, I accepted the Lord, but there's no change in my life. You know, I'm not really aiming at nothing, and I probably was never saved to begin with. It was just some mental thing. But you see, the, the, diff, the, the, I don't know, what is it, 18 inches from your brain to your heart makes a big difference. Because if you, if you say it with your mind, but you don't believe it in your heart, there is no change. There, it's really of no effect. Ralph Erskine said, True faith is never alone, but still joined with the gospel obedience. As ye have received, so walk. He that would separate faith from obedience endeavors to walk with one foot which is impossible. Faith and works, faith and holiness are the two feet by which a man walks in Christ. When the Spirit of Christ promotes the one, he promotes the other also. If a man should try to go up upon one foot, he could not walk, but only hop, which would be impossible for him to continue long. Neither can obedience be consistent without faith, and such consistency will be measured of the gospel walk. So do we have a gospel walk? Are we walking according to God? I'll leave it there because, you know, I'm not perfect either. Nobody's perfect, but the encouragement is there. Jesus encouraged us to do so as well. Now we're going to get into a different part, the fourth, fourth and last part of this chapter, which is Amaziah gets owned. Uh, Amos sort of is going to put him in his place, if I may, and then God is sort of going to throw his two cents in there as well. Look, look what it says in, in verse uh, 10. Uh, then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, now this is uh, Amaziah uh, talking, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. Now Amos starts, he, um, Jeroboam is not there first off, okay? Because it says he sent, he sent somebody to go tell him this. He said, Bethel sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Am this is line number one, there's two lies here. Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. So he was saying Amos' sole purpose there was to sort of instigate, to rile up the people against the king. That's not what Amos was there for, and Amos is going to tell him why he's there in a bit. Line number two, the land is not able to bear all his words. Now this is my opinion. This is my opinion. This is what I get from the, from the scriptures after reading it. But if the land is not able to bear the words of Amos, why didn't they kick him out already? So many times, Paul, when he went, and in the book of Acts, a lot of times when the people didn't want to hear the message, they kicked him out. They beat him, they whipped him, they threw him in jail, they let him out after a while. But if the people didn't bear the words of Paul, they kicked him out. Here, the people, it was all alone. It was just Amos and the people. Amos versus the people. And um, they didn't kick him out. So why didn't they kick him out? This is a lie. The land is not able to bear all his words. If that was true, if what Amaziah was saying was true about Amos, he would have been long gone. Let's turn to Acts chapter 17. In Acts chapter 17, we have a similar situation with Paul. Acts 17 verse 1. 
Now, when they had passed through uh, Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there were, was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I preach to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. When it says not a few of the leading women, it means a lot of women joined him as well. But the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace, and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, and sought to bring him out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. You see, when there was an uproar in the city, when, when the people didn't like what they were hearing, they would eventually kick the prophet out or the, or the apostle out. Here, that was not happening. Here, this, this uh, was a lie. What does Amos say? Uh, what does uh, Amaziah say again? For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword. That, that was kind of true. Yeah, Jer Jeroboam would, would die. That's true in a sense. And Israel shall surely be led away captive from their own land. Yeah, that, that was true. That was true. He, he was, there was no controversy over that. But he starts out with two lies. Now Amaziah, the first time Amaziah speaks, he, he sends a letter to the king. Now he's going to direct his attention to uh, sort of uh, to Amos. There's a conversation between the, uh, I guess if you will, the prophet of the Lord and the, uh, and the priest of Baal. Okay? You know, and the, here's round one. And he says, for thus, uh, he says, go, you seer, flee to the land of Judah. So he's telling them, go back to your country. Go back to your shepherding down the south. We don't want you here. And he says, there eat bread and there prophesy. I'm in verse 12, by the way. There eat bread and there prophesy. But never again prophesy at Bethel in verse 13. You see, Amaziah was, was a people pleaser. Amaziah was a hireling, okay? He, he, he was there to please the king and to please the people. He didn't want to hear God's word, obviously. How do I know that? Let's finish verse 13. For it is the king's sanctuary, and it is the royal residence. What does he mean by that? This was the church the king went to. But where was the king at? Why did he have to send somebody to send him a message? He wasn't at church, right? Where was the king? How many churches do we see today that are like that, that don't preach the gospel, that really are sort of, uh, uh, you have pastors that are hirelings. They, 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 they preach what the people, the, what the tingling ears want to hear. You know, no doubt they're big churches. I don't doubt that for a minute, you know. But the focus is off of God. The focus is off of the Word of God. And no longer can you really call those churches churches, right? I wonder what would happen if, if every pastor from the east to, to the west, and the United States, from the east coast to the west coast, would just preach the gospel unashamedly, regardless of what the people might think, well, regardless of, you know, what others might say, but just to preach what God says in His Word, you know. Not, nothing out of context, just straight truth there would be a big change in, in our country. Yeah. You know that. Now in verse 14, we're going to see Amos respond. Okay, now Amos has been quiet. He gives him his time to speak. Amos is going to respond two times here. Amos' first response, verse 14. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, four things he's going to tell him. I was no prophet, right? We know that. Ver ch ver chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, it tells us who Amos was. He says, nor was I a son of a prophet, third thing, but I was a sheep breeder. And fourth thing, and a tender of sycamore fruit, right? I've said it many times again. Sorry if I sound like a broken record, but Amos was a shepherd and a, and a, a, a produce worker, right? And a migrant worker. And that's what he was. That, that's all he was, right? So Amaziah might have had a master's and a PhD in Baal and calf worship, but, but Amos had, a, had, a, had his BA, right? He was born again, and I, I guess you can say that in the Old Testament. He, 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 he followed the Lord, and his qualification was that God had called him. And then, let's see what he, what he ends up saying here. Then the Lord took me as I followed the flock, in verse 15. And the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. You see, 
it all goes back to God calling you. You know, if God, John, uh, in the book of John, it tells us that God has called us from the darkness and he's put us in the light. He's called us out of the light, darkness, now we're in the light, right? Our sins are exposed in the light. So people can choose to, to, uh, to repent and follow Jesus when your sins are exposed or they can just crawl back in the darkness. But when you are in the light, that means God has called you. But what has God called you to do? What is God calling you to do? What, what is your, your ministry per se? What, what, what does God call us to do? We know Amos' calling was to go prophesy to my people Israel. In verse 15 it tells us that God was very clear. Go prophesy to the northern, northern kingdom. Sometimes we think we need to have a, a sort of a paper or, or something saying that you're qualified uh, to do this. Well, I'm, we're going to watch a short three-minute video, and then I'll finish the chapter real quick. All right, next up, um, King David. Thanks for coming, King David. What qualifies you to be our next small group leader? <clears throat> well, what was that word you used uh, before my name? Uh, king? Yeah, King, right. How many of those am I up against? My strengths. Uh, plagues. I'm pretty good with the staff. Can't decide who gets the last brownie? Cut it in two. Boom. Wisdom. Um, parting large bodies of water. <laughs> Desert survival skills. Weaknesses. <laughs> Weaknesses. <laughs> Mountain climbing, um, commandment retrieval. Does that look weak to you? And I can make a pretty mean goat sausage. Okay, I mean, maybe haircuts, women, whose isn't? <laughs> so I lied, I said my wife was my sister. They were gonna kill me. <laughs> Why are we even getting into this? I'm just not sure we're comfortable with you in a leadership position. Look, it, it... Jesus Christ himself called you Satan. He was trying to make a point. Get thee behind me, Satan, I believe is the exact quote. Bathsheba, I knew you were gonna go there. It was a rock to the back of the head. I really regret that it happened. And that's when you slept with the maid? My wife said she was fine with it. Abraham. What? Come on. Okay, timeline. Um, first I slept with his wife. No, 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 no. I didn't kill Christians. Then I lied to him. I was just watching people's coats. Then I had him killed, okay? They killed Christians. It's a long time ago. Besides, that was a different guy. That was Saul. <laughs> I've never killed anyone. Why? You got somebody giving you beef? Huh? You need something taken care of? Where's the app? Yo, bring it, huh? Didn't you deny Christ three times? No. Nah, I'm pretty sure you did. No. Yeah, I'm almost positive. Uh... Okay, I did. No, I've never killed anyone. Why would you even ask that question? This is the guy. Hold on, I, I mean, I do have some questions about my qualifications. I've never been to seminary. Oh, you'll do fine. I really don't have a whole lot of experience. Do you love God? Yeah. Do you want to help people? Sure. Do you have a harem? No, I don't have a harem. <laughs> All right, we're good then, thank you. Let me, let me think about this Perfect. for... <laughs> oh, 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 get her. Oh, wait a second. Look who has them. Still got the tablets. If you want to watch that uh, fisherman's video or uh, evangelism fishing, that's where I got it from, too. Um, but yeah, the point I'm trying to make with the video is, uh, you know, everybody's qualified. If you're born again, you're qualified to, to serve the Lord in whatever he's calling you to do. And to finish up the chapter here in uh, verse uh, 16, Amos finishes up with the second response. It says, Now therefore hear the word of the Lord. You say, Do not prophesy against Israel and do not spout against the house of Isaac. So he's sort of uh, reiterating what uh, Amaziah had told him. And uh, verse 17 it says, that Then God is, is going to, sort of God is going to step in for him and, and, and speak. See, not now uh, Amos is sort of going to talk infallibly here with God, God speaking. It says uh, in verse 17, Therefore, thus says the Lord, your wife shall be a harlot in the city. Now, there's uh, five things that Amaziah, this, I guess you can call this the, the vision against Amaziah, if you will. Uh, the first one, is, he says, your wife will be a harlot in the city. Right, so Amaziah was going to lose his wife. The second thing, uh, Amos tells him, uh, your sons and daughters shall fall by the sword. 
So they, he was going to lose his offspring. He was going to lose his children. Now the first part there was says he was going to lose his wife. She was going to be a, a harlot. Some commentators say that when the Assyrians came, they were going to sort of force the woman into harlotry. Other commentators would say, well, when he, became, he was going to become poor, eventually she had to resort to prostitu prostitution. Whatever the case, he was going to lose his wife. His children were going to die. The third thing here is he was going to lose his property. It says, your land shall be divided by a survey line. So he was going to end up losing property as well. Wife, children, property. Sounds like uh, um, Job. Let's see here. Uh, except for the wife part anyway. He was going to lose his life. He says, you shall die in a defiled land. That means an exile. So he was going to lose his life eventually. And he was going to lose his country as we read in this last verse. And Israel shall surely be led away captive from his own uh, land. So he tells him five things. He tells him five uh, sort of... If you don't believe me that I'm a that I'm a prophet from God, I'm gonna show you. And this is what's gonna I'm gonna show you five things that are gonna happen. So he tells him, you know, your wife, your your children, your land, you're gonna lose this. And I think, well, obviously Amaziah lived to see these things. The Bible doesn't record it, but we know that that history records uh, the Assyrians coming in and taking taking them over. So Amaziah was gonna see that this was the one true God, and Amos was the one true prophet of God. Okay. That concludes the chapter uh, for today. We'll finish up the, the next uh, two visions that, uh, that Amos has in chapter, uh, chapter 8. Um, but just ponder on this. This chapter talks about prayer. It talks about interceding for people and having that heart for people. It talks about God not changing but relenting his judgment upon people that repent, right? And this chapter also talks about visions. It talks about faithfulness. It talks about qualifications, right? So I want you guys to just ponder on that as you guys go home and see how the Lord wants to sort of speak to you and, and uh, throughout the, the week. Let's go ahead and close, uh, bow our eyes and, uh, close our heads and bow our, bow our eyes in prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for, uh, for tonight. We pray, Lord, that you enable us, that you prepare us to, for the rest of the week, Father God. We pray that you prepare our hearts right now to worship you in spirit and truth as well, Father God. Please, Father God, just uh, give us some vision in our life, Father God. Speak to us, Lord. Show us what, what you would have us do for for your kingdom, Father God, because you are coming back soon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.